what would you say to me, ladies and gentlemen, are you with me? This is quite important. What would you say to me if you said by shooting radiation at a tape of Mozart, you could, by points mutations induced by that radiation, you could change the tape of one Mozart into Beethoven, just by point mutations. Well, you know, this has been done, been tried out by Schützenberger. And he's run it through on some of the biggest com uh, computers in Paris at the Sorbonne. Now, the result which he gave, he gave to one of the symposia held at the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia some years ago. And he proved his point to the Hitch, you know. He can't do it. If you shoot at a tape, you may get minor. You may get minor changes. You will get minor changes. But listen to me here and don't please misquote me afterwards. I'm going to be very careful. You can't change one total holistic program of information storage and retrieval into another holistic program of information storage and retrieval by point mutations. You can reduce one tape to noise, informational noise, and you can reduce the other tape to informational noise, but you can't change a holistic program one into another by that means. There's no way of doing it. Because if you shoot information with noise, informational noise, noise in inverted commas, we say, if you shoot it, you reduce it to noise. You can make one or two minor changes. Oh, yes, you can do that. You can even do it with the gene of the human and shoot at it and produce sickle cell anemia. But you, in doing that, you may make the man uh, who got, gets the sickle cell anemia, you may make him immune to malaria. But to change his whole program into that of an ape, or to change an ape's program, or any other primate you may like to, to say, one holistic program into another, is a very, 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 very doubtful piece of information to you. So think of that very carefully when they blandly say that the program of an amoeba, by chance, point mutations, was changed over long periods of time and increased in information in the last analysis up to a man. You know, an information expert is going to cough at that one. I've discussed it with one of my young professors who just got a chair in Germany in information theory. And we've been right through this at the bottom, to the bottom. And he says, Colleague, you won't do that. It's one of the most inconceivable things which information theory can demand with regard to the changing of one species into another because it involves changing one holistic program into another by shooting at it with point mutations. Now, those are the words of men who know, who know what they're talking about, but it's never been applied to biology with success until now. We're getting more success in applying these things because people are taking courses in information theory. And then they see what they're asking. Ignorant people say it's very easy to do this, that, and the other. But when you come down to doing it, that's a very different matter, or very different matter indeed. So leave that one. Don't take it glibly when they say it was done that way. It's one of the most difficult things you can imagine. And I personally, but this is my personal opinion, I personally believe that to do it that way is nonsense. The best way to do it is to wipe out the first program and then put a second on it. You can do that much more easily than by point mutations. So leave that one. That's the third one. The fourth one is that the protozoans gave rise to the metazoans spontaneously. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to be fair, and I'm going to put you both sides very clearly. There is some evidence for that. But it's evidence 
that can easily be analyzed and put out of court. You see, you do get protozoans that change into slime molds. And these slime molds, well, they're first of all like an amoeba, and then they coalesce together and form what you might call a colony. And that's what we're after, metazoans. They have nuclei free in the cytoplasm in some cases. Now you say, well, okay, now here you've got an example. Here what you're arguing about. Here's an example. A protozoan going into a metazoan of sorts. Well, what do you say to that? Well, I say this. The important thing in life is undoubtedly the genetic code. The genetic code is the basis on which we grow up also from a protozoan. Because our zygote that made us is certainly one cell. And it looks, might be, for some you didn't know, uh, like a protozoan having one cell. But in this change of a protozoan to a metazoan, to a slime mold, there's no genetic change. That remains constant. Now, they've done their theory on gross morphology. And gross morphology is a very dangerous thing for classifying animals. You look at us. When you were conceived by your mother and father, you were one zygote, one egg, fertilized by one or several, as the case may be, sperms. Now, if that's the case, and you just had a zygote thrust in front of you and didn't know where it came from, you know, you'd be excused if you said, this is a one-cell organism. And it is. But if you looked at the genes and the chromosomes, you'd find the 46 chromosomes in it. And you have rather difficult in lining that up with an amoeba, you know, or with another protozoan. What you need to do then is look at the stored information to see whether that's increasing. Because the information on that zygote is enough to build a whole man, which isn't the case in an amoeba. Now, if that's the case, the only real evidence for evolution in the true sense of the word, namely that information is increased to produce increasing complexity of complex organisms, the only basis to do it on is genetic. Gross morphology can deceive you. The egg, certainly, that we were, doesn't look like us from a gross morphological situation. But its genes do. As soon as they start to differentiate, you can see it. Now, that's, the, fifth, uh, that's the, the, the fourth point. The fifth point is this. Oh, the fourth point, I must say, there's no evidence for it from a genetic point of view. So it's an assumption. The fifth assumption of, um, in the basis of evolution is that various invertebrate phyla are, not, are interrelated. Now, there's no evidence for that. You think of the spiders and the flies and relating to the crabs and the octopuses. Very, very difficult. Very, very difficult to do. The evidence, indeed, is shaky. And fossil evidence, there isn't. So what are you going to do about that? The, the, the sixth assumption is this, that the invertebrates gave rise to the vertebrates. There's no concrete evidence for that. You've still got to change. You've got no fossils for it. And you've still got to change the genetic holistic code of an invertebrate with its nervous system around the, around the gullet to the nervous system of vertebrate at the back of the gullet. How are you going to do it? No evidence for it. The seventh and the last is within the vertebrates, the fishes, the amphibia, the reptiles, the birds, and the mammals, there's a common ancestral stock. Well, all I can say is this. Well, I could produce you today in animals that are living a wonderful gradation which would be evolutionary in starting at single cellular organisms or viruses, if you like, a bacteria, and up to man in animals that today are living. And if I found them as fossils, I could easily say these are evolutionary. They derive one from the other. But what evidence? The fact that you've got a gradation in organization and a likelihood in gross morphology, a, simil a similitude in gross uh, morphology, doesn't prove, you know. It's just simply that you've got a gradation 
in organization, but he doesn't say that therefore one is derived from the other. Now, these are the seven assumptions. By their nature, there's not one capable of verification or falsification in the scientific lab today. Now, on the basis that you make creationism, because it's not verifiable in the lab today, that you call it metaphysical, on that very same basis, by the very same token, evolution is in the same boat. So what are you going to do about it? It's a dangerous thing if you're in the same boat to rock it, you know. One will turn out the other if two antagonists rock the boat and they're both drowned. So let's be very, very careful of doing that. Now you say, is that quite true, what you said about fossils? I don't want to talk a lot about fossils because I'm not a paleontologist, but I will let a paleontologist talk about them. You see, in the British Museum, they've had a lot of trouble lately. They absorb lots and lots of taxpayers' money. And England's got two and a half million unemployed. And they're getting wary about taxpayers' money. And they go into the British Museum and they find an enormous amount of taxpayers' money proclaiming evolution. So the evolutionists there have got wary. Karl Popper has done his work. And they say, you're using taxpayers' money for metaphysics. Well, if you use taxpayers' money for metaphysical and religious purposes, you will rapidly get into hot water there now because they're bankrupt. And when you get to that stage, if your currency does happen to collapse, as it may might well do in the Western world, you know, as we're going on, you get into increasing trouble on this, on this account. So do you know what they've done? The leader of the paleontological, paleontology in the British Museum is now, at this moment, going through the whole museum and relating his and relabeling his trees, ancestral trees, evolutionary trees, he's relabeling them. And he's relabeling them loud and clear an unscientific theory, a hypothesis. Now, after all these years, after Darwin, to go through and do that is surely a remarkable way to say that evolution has been proved. You think what's been said on your radio and television in the last month just on that question, and then you look at these scholars, what they're doing when they get the wind up, okay? Now, I'm going to let paleontologists speak to you just one minute. Uh, it's Dr. Colin Patterson, head of the British Museum Paleontology. And he's writing to your Dr. Luther Sutherland recently. I have the letter. Gould, he says, and the American Museum people are hard to contradict when they say that there are no transitional fossils. Okay, no transitional fossils. As a paleontologist myself, I will lay it down on the line. There is not one such fossil for which any for which one could make any watertight argument. Is Archaeopteryx the ancestor of all birds? Perhaps yes. Perhaps no. There is no way of answering this question. It's easy enough to make up stories of how one form gave rise to another and to find reasons why the stages should be favored by natural selection, but such stories are not part of science. For there is no way of putting them to the test of verification or falsification. Now that's why Karl Popper called the theory, and he's an evolutionist through and through and he's an atheist, Call it metaphysical. He doesn't believe in God, but he does call the theory metaphysical on that basis. Now, there's one thing I must say before I go any further. Colin Patterson forgot one thing. I think he must have known it, but you know, in the heat of the battle, you often forget. I do. He forgot that recently in America, you would have seen the notice, those who read the literature, that 
some geologists have proved that Archaeopteryx is younger than the modern birds, geologically. Now, if Archaeopteryx is younger than the birds, as they say it is, read the articles in the literature, as they say it is, then, of course, Archaeopteryx can't be the origin, the ancestor of the birds. After all, my, kin my children can't be my ancestor. They're younger, aren't they? I mean, you, you can't work it both ways like that. So if Archaeopteryx, as the geologists tell me, and they've got very, very good evidence for it, there's first-class evidence for it, if Archaeopteryx, which has the teeth in its beak, you know, is halfway stage between the uh, reptiles and the birds, you're going to have a hard job proving it if he's younger. Um, you must remember that the feathers of Archaeopteryx, their most perfect feathers. Archaeopteryx was probably quite a strong flyer by judging by the structure of the feathers. There's no trace of the reptile scales in them. Now, if that's the case, then we better be very careful of the evidence we have before we start proclaiming in the schools and proclaiming on the TV and proclaiming on the radio that evolution is a fact and only the uninitiated and the uninformed, as I was told the other night by a professor, couldn't believe in it. I think that the other, the corollary, might easily be the case. Now, if that is the case, what are we going to say from a practical point of view? Now, I want to give you something to bite on and chew on. I don't like breaking things down, you know. It's easy to break things down. The difficult job is to build things up. So we've got to build things up. And I'm going to give you now just a little basis on which we can try to build things up. You see, the origin of life, and therefore the origin of man, man's origin, is coupled with the origin of the genetic code. OK? I saw an article in Science recently that men used to say that in the beginning was the Logos. That's what they used to say. Your fathers used to say it. Pious people here in Iowa, aren't they? Uh, what are you going to say today? Well, science says we'd better say today that in the origin, in the beginning, was the DNA molecule or the RNA molecule. Well, okay, I don't mind if you do, because you've got to get the information out in a coded system of information storage and retrieval to get any form of life. If you can get the RNA or the DNA molecule somehow or another, you might have the possibility of getting hold of man by the same way. The whole problem of me is to get 46 chromosomes in one cell, a zygote, and put me in a uterus, and you've got me or you, as the case may be. Now, <laughs> if you can do that, that's the problem. Now, I would like to suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, this thing. That if you look at the DNA molecule, it certainly is. It qualifies for the definition of a logos, because it is a book which stores information, retrieves information, and executes information by the ribosomes riding on the DNA, on the RNA molecule, and then spitting you out by translating the information that's on it. Now, the question is, how are we going to do that from a scientific point of view? That is, to get the DNA molecule out, A, with its structure, its chemical structure. Its chemical structure involves, of course, pure D molecules, optically active D molecules. Where are you going to get them from? from stochastic chemistry. They must be D. If you put in a racemic, the spirals are very short, and the information is, of course, nothing in them. You can get the structure, short structures, but the information is certainly not there. Now, Eigen, Manfred Eigen in Germany, who's a materialist, he thinks he's got a method of doing it. And I can't go into the deeper methods of his hypercycles, but I will do something on it in the time that's allotted to me. He says this. Are you with me? He says, well, have a hat. 
Well, a hat's a good thing to start with, isn't it? And we'll put in it uh, the letters of the alphabet, the, th the 26 letters that we have, each one about 100 times. And he says he's invented then, to produce his hypercycles, he's invented then a system of dicing. And you dice, and you couple the numbers of the dice to the letters of the alphabet which you want. And so he dices, and he produces by dicing, that is by stochastic means. He produces the letter, the word, A, N, D. You can do it. Stochastic dicing will do it. And he says, by that means... I have produced one word of the English alphabet, of the English language, of the English language convention, and a conjunction, the plus sign in our language. We all know what the plus sign means. Uh, now, was he right? Did he really produce a language such as the genetic code is? together with its language convention, such as we have in the genetic code and such as we have in the English language, and did he produce the meaning, which is the plus sign? Three things you've got to produce. Did he do it? Well, let's just have a look. We'll see if we can do this one easily. Here you've got your genetic code. Okay? Now, the genetic code is built up. Okay, can you all see that? Is it roughly right? Okay. Right. We've got the genetic code, which be compared to the Morse code. The Morse code has two letters, the dot and the dash, and, of course, the interval. Mustn't forget that. And if you want to signify that you're in trouble, you can use two codes to express it. You can use the SOS, save our souls, uh, I'm in peril, you see? Uh, that's what um, SOS means. That's the basic meaning behind it. Now, you can produce SOS by chance, can't you? But dicing, just as Manfred Eigen produced the AND. No difficulty about it. No problem there. Now, if you like, you can take your SOS, which is a reduced entropy system. It's an unlikely pattern. Or you can translate it by this method into the code system, the Morse code system, the dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot. Now, you see, you've got here I have a very special reason for doing this, because there are very few people see this. But once you see it, the whole world goes up in your, goes into your understanding. These two entropy systems, these two patterns, which have been produced by dicing, no doubt about them, you can. They look very different, don't they? But the same meaning is attached to both by language convention. Those of you who have learned the Morse code, attach the language convention to that system of dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot. Those who know what SOS means, who know what telephone boxes on your, oh, you call them booths, don't you? I'm sorry. Telephone booths on the highways mean. But the reduced entropy system is quite different, the pattern. Now, if I do this experiment that Eigen did and produce SOS and show it to you, you say, oh, yes. There's peril. He's got appendicitis or stomachache or uh, gout or, or something like that, don't you? And he needs help. You, you know what it means. If I show the dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot to say a radio officer, he says, oh, ship in distress, let's help. Now, if I show this system to a bushman in South America, in South Africa, uh, he looks at SOS, and he says, pretty, 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 hang it round my neck. Wonderful, make a nice lot of string of beads for me. Uh, he, he, doesn't, uh, he doesn't know what it means. Why not? 
that reduced entropy system means nothing to him because he doesn't know the language convention. If you show this dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot to a bushman, he says the same. Pretty, 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 hang it round my neck, a string of beads. He doesn't know what it means. You understood immediately because you have the language convention. So when you produced, are you with me, SOS by dicing, the meaning is hung on to it later, not at the time that you produce it by the selective dicing. Okay? The meaning of dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot is not there until you've learned the language convention and arbitrarily associated that same meaning to those two different entropy systems. So what I'm trying to tell you is this, that if you did produce the genetic code by stochastic chemistry, as you could, there's no evidence at all that you've attached meaning to it until somebody has produced a language convention. Now, in a system which is devoid of life, there are no language conventions because language conventions are between two systems of entropy into which somebody who wants to attach information and transmit it has hung that meaning. And you can take any meaning and arbitrarily attach it to any reduced entropy system, any system of reduced entropy. That can be done. So what Eigen has produced by this method is certainly reduced entropy, but he hasn't attached meaning to it. And the genetic code is meaning. Now I'm going to do one other thing in there, and then I'm going to stop. How's my time? 20 to 9. I'm going to produce one other point here, which is of vital uh, importance to the understanding of this system that we're talking about at this stage. Uh, if you produce a meaningless word like A-N-D or P-E-A equals P or A-P-E equals A, there's no meaning in it until you've attached meaning to it. So what Eigen says when he realizes this fact, he says, I produce meaningless words which make up the genetic code, and then I take the ribosomes to ride upon the RNA, and in going over these words, the ribosomes produce meaning. So he says, by translation, I am really producing meaning. Now, is that translation? The answer is no. Because if I have a machine which takes meaningless words and produces meaning, what I'm doing is I have a creation machine there. And the creation machine, of course, arose by chance. And the creation mean it means itself, the creation means itself, the ribosome, is also full of optically active substances which stochastic chemistry can't produce. So where are you getting? I mean, the difficulties you make with this system are so great that no real problems are solved. The latest way of doing it is to say that this system, which produces reduced entropy and then fills them up with meaning without a language convention, that that system didn't take place on Earth, but took place somewhere out in outer space. Well, to push a problem a long way from you doesn't solve the problem. You know. You've got to find your, 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 your means here and now right under your nose to be able to explain a matter like that. So I find this, that it's exceedingly difficult for me to believe that A, stochastic chemistry produced the seven hypotheses of the evolutionary theory. That's the first thing. We know that not one of them, not one of them can be repeated. The second thing is this. Although chemistry may produce reduced entropy, 
by stochastic means. I have no doubt about that. Prigogine got his Nobel Prize for showing that. I have no doubt about that. But the origin of a system which produces meaning from meaningless words is merely to say that matter is creative. Now, matter is not creative. Matter is not teleonomic. And you've got to take that into account if you're going to say that a machine passes over ribos passes that a machine like the ribosomes passes over um, e reduced entropy systems like that and produces meaning. That won't do. And those are my difficulties, ladies and gentlemen. Now I make you one final proposition, and I would like you to try and go with me. You know, it's very, very uh, exhausting to do these things in a mixed audience. Some of whom know what you're talking about, and some don't. And that reflects on the poor man trying to do the job uh, very, very heavily, and he struggles to make it free and to make it clear to you all, and that's what I'm trying to do. Now, I'm going to try and make it really finally clear to you, but not dogmatically. I'm going to try and win you for a new line of thought. I don't think you'll have thought of this one. If you have, please put up your hand afterwards, and I'll shake your hands and say, Collie, to you, this is just wonderful. Now, look. <laughs> uh, look. You see, I'm struggling because I've got a difficult idea to put over you, but I will put it over now. Um, we once had a colleague at the University of Illinois, and his name was Saul Spiegelman. Uh, you may know him, but he was an excellent chemist, an excellent biochemist. And you know, he took a simple virus to pieces, and then took the bits and crystallized them up and got them absolutely pure. Now the bits that he had after taking the virus to pieces were non-living. They were inorganic. And he blocked the valences by special chemical means, which I can't tell you now because it would take quite a long time to do. He blocked the valences that mustn't combine and left the valences open that must. And after about two or three years' hard work, he got the bits 